anyone who visited us in our old house knows that the water quality from our water well shown in the bottom left of this photo was pretty substandard. It was our most important decision to make before we committed to building the new house, how to improve the water quality. We looked at lots of options. We looked at drilling a new well, but with limited space on the lot, drilling another well and hoping for a different result seemed a bit like a low probability of success. We looked at treating the water, but the chemistry is quite challenging. And the solution that made the most sense, reverse osmosis, wastes as much water as it generates, uses a lot of energy and is pretty maintenance intensive. So ultimately, we decided that the system that would work for us and gave us confidence committing to the new house was to harvest rainwater. Harvesting rainwater is not normal. Why doesn't everyone do it? Well, you need to get comfortable that it will work, obviously, and to do that you need to complete what is called a water balance. You essentially need to understand the supply of water that you will have in the form of rain, and you need to balance that off against what you feel you'll consume in the house, um, in the household for living, washing, cleaning, flushing toilets, having showers, all of the things that consume water in your house, plus the irrigating that you plan to do in your garden and on your lawn and washing your car outside and all of those things. So you need to understand the water balance. Now, the first thing you notice when you live in Comox, everyone feels the West Coast is very wet and very rainy, and it is in the winter time, but in the summertime, it's actually quite dry. This little chart just shows the actual statistics of rainfall in Comox and you see lots of water in January, February, it starts to taper off in March and then it starts to rain again in October, November, December. So it's quite a challenging supply system because although you, over a year you get lots of rain, you actually don't get a lot in the summer. So let's compare that to consumption. Consumption by um, its nature is much more stable. The number of people in the house doesn't really change. The number of showers you have every day and the amount of dishes you wash doesn't really change month by month by month. You might have a bit of an increase in the summertime when you're watering your garden and your lawn and your plants, um, but for the most part, consumption is much flatter. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that you need to have enough storage to rely on in the dry summer months uh, that you have filled up with water in the winter when it's raining a lot. And if you're going to have a big storage volume to rely on in the dry summer, you have to have enough roof area in your system to ensure that you capture enough rain to actually fill it. So a big tank and as much roof area as you can afford is the secret to rainwater harvesting in a climate like Comox. Okay, so now I know I'm being a bit of a nerd here, but bear with me. It's actually a little more complex than that even. In the dry summer months when it rains, it only rains a little bit every day, and the efficiency of what you capture off the roof is not as high. Half the water that hits the hot metal roof evaporates before it gets to your tank, things like that. When it rains a lot, it's easier to catch a lot of the water. You also can truck water in, so you need to factor that into your supply. And on the consumption side, you can actually do some clever things to help you manage your consumption. So when you factor all of this in, you get a complete water balance. And so what have we ended up with and what's our plan? Well, we've managed to find a way to create quite a large cistern under the garage, 58,000 liters of storage, which is quite a bit. We've managed with the covered porch and the garage to create quite a bit of roof area, 2,900 square feet. We installed a little fitting in the cistern so that we can import purchased water from a truck. And on the consumption side, we're going to use our water well for irrigation, which helps a lot in the summertime. We can water as much as we want without impacting the cistern. We'll buy efficient appliances. We've got a hot water recirculation valve so you don't waste water waiting for the shower to get hot. And finally, 
all the research I've done says that with a little bit of awareness and a bit of a behavior change, you can drastically reduce the amount of water that you actually consume every day. The average Canadian uses 450 liters of water every day. Every person in every house uses 450 liters a day on average. A lot of that's for irrigation. So we would taken that out with the well. And a lot of that is just wasteful behaviors. So we think that we can get by with 160 liters per person per day. So is that a good assumption? Well, when you throw all of this math into the water balance, you get a picture that is really quite promising. The green bars on here show the volume of water in the cistern uh, over a three year period. And what you see is that it takes one or two months when it starts to rain in the fall to fill the cistern right up. It stays full for five or six months of the year. And in the summer, it depletes, but still is always more than half full. That's with two people in the house. With three people in the house, it would be a little bit touchier, but our neighbor's system uh, helps me validate the math and have a lot of confidence that this is going to work really well. So the next thing is actually designing the system, looking at your roof, deciding where all the downspouts should go, and on your site, how are you going to capture the water and where and how are you going to move it to your cistern? Now, ideally, you put your cistern at the lowest point on your property and all the rain falls from the sky, off your roof, through your gutters, down the downspouts and into the tank. No problem. The pro I put this photo in to just highlight one of the predicaments we had was our site slopes towards the water, of course, but there's really not very much room behind the house to put a big cistern. And it's on the slope and it's potentially unstable and we don't want to put a big massive weight of a bunch of water on the slope. So our tank ends up being in front of the house, uphill from where the water wants to flow. So in our system, the rain will flow off the roof into a small buried tank behind the house, and we will pump the water up the hill back to the front of the house and into the cistern. So these next few photos just illustrate that round green tank, which goes behind the house. We call it the transfer tank. All the water that comes off the roof goes into that little tank and ultimately when it fills up the pump turns on there's a pump in the bottom of the tank and it pumps the water up to the front of the house up the hill about 10 feet higher to the cistern so from here let's just follow a drop of water how do you design an entire system to capture rainwater the first thing is a metal roof is great and a steep metal roof is really good um, they trap less contaminants they shed the water efficiently now from the roof, it goes into the gutters, and from the gutters, it goes into the downspouts, but they're not all created equal. We chose to put in some, what people would call premium gutters. They're half round, they're not um, an angular shape like most gutters um, we typically see are. Half round is very efficient. The water concentrates in the bottom part of the circle, and it flows efficiently moving debris efficiently and as such I thought that would be a good choice um, for the gutter system. Another rule of rainwater harvesting is only put clean water in your cistern. Um, so these little screens at the bottom of the downspouts are the first line of defense to keeping the water clean. You see they are quite a big grate um, and you have to sort of continually monitor them and scoop out the leaves and pine cones that are going to accumulate in those little hoppers. Um, but that is the first uh, very coarse level of filtration that we have on the water. Now from this point in the system, the water goes underground. So here I'm showing the white um, PVC underground collection system that routes the water from the downspouts um, into the, the downspouts all go into the vertical pieces that you see on that sloping line. It all runs around, all the downspouts aggregate into one line, which effectively and ultimately goes into this green line, which goes into this high-tech German vortex filter, which is really the primary cleaning mechanism that we have on our water uh, to make sure that the water that goes into our storage system is clean. Now this thing is pretty neat. Um, it's a vortex filter. What you see there is the top 
horizontal line is the inlet. You can see it enters on the side and the water comes in and swirls around. There's a metal strainer basket inside which filters the leaves and the pine cones out. The debris goes out the bottom and the clean water goes out the white line in this picture and into the transfer tank. It's really quite clever. You'll see the water here in a moment. It starts to swirl around. When the screen gets wet, the water starts to flow through the screen, and you only see a small percentage of the water, um, which would have the debris in it, is dripping down the bottom, which is actually the waste flow. The clean water is going through the screen, and you can't see uh, where it's going in this view. Here you get a bit of an idea what the thing looks like uh, and uh, the screen up in the top right. And really what I would draw your attention to is the chart in the bottom left, which basically says these things are incredibly efficient. You have to have a massive flow rate of water before this thing doesn't um, perform. 95% of the water should get captured and only 5% of the water should go out the bottom with the debris. Here you see that clean water flowing into the green transfer tank. There's another look at what that tank looks like. I know the water doesn't look clean. That's an old photo from early on when we had filled the, the, the tank with, with grungy um, groundwater just so we had water on site for construction purposes. So here's another interesting thing that you need to think of. So remember I said there's a pump in the transfer tank. This is what the pump looks like, more or less. And there's a level switch, a float, in the tank as well that when the tank fills up, the float floats to the top, it flips a switch and it turns the pump on. As the pump empties the tank, the water level drops and the float drops down to the bottom. When the float gets near the bottom, it switches again and turns the pump off again. So you need to size that pump properly. You need to know how fast is this tank going to fill up if it's raining really hard, and you have to have a pump that's powerful enough to empty it faster than it's raining, and you also want a pump powerful enough to empty the tank relatively quickly so that it's not running for hours and hours every day. It's kind of an interesting experiment, and the chart um, in the uh, the charts on this picture just just show that even in a heavy rain in this climate with say three inches of rain in one day this pump is ten times will move a volume of water ten times bigger than even a massive rainstorm so the pump will always be able to keep up with a heavy rain and its size so that if it's not raining and the pump turns on it should only take about ten minutes to empty the tank So returning to the cistern, the ultimate destination for the storage of all of this beautiful rainwater that we're going to use in the house. Here you see photos from early on in the construction, cistern in the distance in this photo. Here you see the walls of the cistern, essentially the basement under the garage being formed. There you see the walls um, with the form stripped off and the fresh concrete. And here you see the clever system which we used to support the floor of the garage, the ceiling of the cistern. It's these clever metal pans. They bridge across the, the span of the garage, the width of the garage. They have these deep channels in between the, the sheets, the pans, and those form almost floor joists in the concrete. There you see the concrete as is poured, the rectangle in the left hand side is going to be the access hatch which will allow us to get down into the cistern if we need to. Now here you see the guys pouring the concrete. I put this little video in because it was a bit of an interesting day. It's a great day um, and the guys were a little nervous walking on his pans. They asked Drew, well is that going to support our weight? He kind of chuckled and said, well it's going to support a car. I think it will support you. There you see the access hatch. And here you see inside the cistern uh, the liner which we are installing inside. You don't you don't need the liner necessarily, but it keeps uh, you from worrying about cracks in the concrete and water leaking out of your cistern. And also, concrete is quite alkaline, so um, it can affect the taste of your water. 
here we have Woody plugging in the transfer pump for the first time and us hoping like hell this is all going to work. Again, don't panic at the little bit of dirt. That's just debris that was obviously in the buried lines between the awesome. transfer That's tank and the yeah. cistern, and that will be diluted with 12,000 gallons of fresh, clean water. And all that sediment will settle to the bottom and awesome. uh, so never get sucked into yeah. the house anyway, which I'll explain a little bit later on in the video. What you see there is called a calming inlet. Uh, the way you want to pump the water into the cistern is you want it to go down near the bottom and you want to reverse the flow so that it's actually U-tubes and comes up near the bottom. It um, keeps from disturbing sediment on the bottom of the tank and it keeps you from disturbing anything floating on the top of the tank. You don't want to just spray it into the top of the tank. It disturbs the water and, and makes it less clean. Here you see two lines um, coming into the cistern. The one on the left, the small one, is the inlet to the cistern from the transfer pump. And the bigger one is just an overflow line. So if it's full and it continues to rain and the pump continues to pump water into the cistern, it will just naturally overflow. Run to the back of the house to our manhole cover and down the slope towards the beach. So the last little bit of the cistern that we haven't spoken about yet is the suction line into the house. So this is the feed line into the house. It's not a great photo, but as you can see, it leaves the cistern down low near the floor. The blue on the right is actually a flexible hose. And there's a screen and a float on the other end of that hose so that the suction line is always pulling the water from just below the surface of the cistern where the cleanest, most aerated water is. So from a water quality perspective, apparently that is the correct place to take your water inlet into the house is from just below the surface. So as this level in the cistern goes up and down, the float will take the suction line up and down, uh, always feeding the house from the right level in the water column in the cistern. You see what I'm trying to say in the left hand side of this little diagram. That gray box on the left represents the cistern and you see the floating suction with the ball that rises up and down with the water level. Now the other part that we haven't talked about at all yet if you follow a drop of water is where does it go when it leaves the cistern? What happens inside the house? So this little diagram is just intended to complete the picture. If you focus on the rectangle in the bottom right where it's labeled basement mechanical room, I'll just quickly let you know what is planned in the house. So you have to have a pump to provide pressure to the house. The water was going to flow out of the cistern through the basement wall and into a jet pump. The pump's going to pressure up the pressure tank, which is the big oval that you see there, which sort of stores some pressure and keeps the pump from having to run all the time. It's like a big balloon, basically. And then the water will go through two filters. It'll go through a five micron sediment filter and it will go through an activated carbon filter. This will remove any particulates, any that are in the cistern water and the carbon filter will help with taste and odor, which I don't expect any, but that should be good protection. And then after it's filtered, it runs through a UV light, which basically sterilizes it and makes it potable water. We're going to run it through a water meter so that we can measure how much we're using and that will help me understand whether all the math that I did at the beginning was correct or not. So at the end of all of this we know from the little video a few minutes ago that we actually have water in the cistern. Will it be any good? Well here you see two samples. One is from Comox, tap water from Comox, and the other is rainwater straight from our transfer tank, so not even filtered in the house. I'm pretty pleased to say that I can't even remember which is which. They look the same. All for now. Bye.